for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. Thursday afternoon, June the 23rd, 1977. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and Conference Grounds Summer Camp Meeting being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. The speaker for the afternoon is Rev. Wynn Worley of the Hedgewich Baptist Church of South Chicago speaking on Jesus and Calvary. I'm going to speak today on the 22nd Psalm. You don't have to speak on demons for demons to manifest. I'll show you that. You also don't have to manipulate the Holy Spirit and our God's people to have a blessing from the Lord. The Word of God is quite sufficient. Manipulation is witchcraft, and we bend over backwards to stay away from that because the Word of God will do the work. If it doesn't do the work, it ought not be done. If the Holy Spirit has to have human means to help him, he's in bad shape. He doesn't need any direction. He just needs us to yield to him and to flow with him. The Bible says the servant of the Lord must not strive. And I know myself and other preachers I've known, many years we strove to produce these wonderful things. You don't do that. You relax and flow with the Holy Spirit. And it's so much more relaxing that way and so much more restful when you just flow with what the Holy Spirit's doing. God doesn't need any defenders. He's able to take care of himself. We need defending, not him. Let's look at the 22nd Psalm. Written several hundred years before crucifixion was even invented, which describes in agonizing detail the price that Jesus Christ paid for you and for me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now you immediately would recognize these are words that came from the cross. At noonday when the lights went out, when God took or turned his back on the Son of God and the lights went out, the stars would not shine on such a sight, neither would the sun, the sun, the stars, the moon, all blacked out. It was the blackest night since the judgment fell on the original creation with Satan's fall. And so the blackness of Night fell on the earth, and you hear the scream, an agonized cry of a lost man coming out of the Savior's lips. Jesus never addressed the Father as God. Check him out. He talked about my Father. But when he took your place and mine, dear friend, he was split from the Father. In a period of time, he was separated. And that separation rang from his lips, the anguish cry that's going to come up out of the pits of hell. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For you see, spiritual death is separation of the soul in hell forever, the second death. The first death happens here, it's physical. Soul and spirit separate from the body, and we say that person is dead. And we bury the body because the life-giving force is gone from it. But the living part of you and me lives on somewhere. Now, the second death on which those who have part in the first resurrection, according to Revelation, will take part, and those will it'll have no power on them, the second death. <clears throat> the second death is separation of the soul from God for eternity. And Jesus Christ experienced both these. Notice the order. First, spiritual death. My God, my God, while thou, why hast thou forsaken me while he lived? That's how we do, isn't it? Ephesians chapter 2. We're born bad. We take a turn for the worse as soon as we learn how. And we are by nature children of wrath by choice. We're children of disobedience. And this is what we end up with. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And every lost man, lost woman on the earth, this is the state. When we come down to die physically, it becomes very finalized. And the, spirit, the physical death follows the spiritual death. This is exactly the progression on the cross, the separation for three long hours from the Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, everybody else had forsaken Jesus, and he hadn't murmured, he hadn't complained at all. 
Go back with me. Maybe we'll have time to recount. Let's go back. Let's back up to the Passover supper. <clears throat> they had had the Passover lamb. The leftover elements were sitting on the table. There was some unleavened bread. There was some fruit of the vine. They poured it out. Jesus blessed it, gave it to his disciples. And Judas took part in it and then went out. Now, some people get all upset because Judas was at the Lord's Supper. It doesn't upset me. There are a lot of lost people gathered around the Lord's table today. All it does is add damnation. Judas committed suicide so soon after that. He hung himself, and evidently the rope broke, and he fell down on some sharp rocks, and it burst him open. But anyway, uh, God took care of that, and he'll take care of lost people at the Lord's table now. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to weed them out. Some of these preachers are so careful. You know, they're trying to be so particular about who comes to the table. It's not their table. It's the Lord's table. He can invite whoever he chooses. And, uh, but after they left, Jesus took them and said, Let's go quickly to the garden. They went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, you remember how he separated them, left eight in one place, and took three a little further. Peter, James, and John said, Wait, pray. My soul is exceedingly troubled. I'm really under pressure. I want you boys to pray with me. And three times, you remember, he came back to find them. And they were sprawled out asleep just like us. They were tired. They were worn out. Did you ever decide to pray all night and wake up 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning all cramped, sound asleep at the side of your bed or wherever you were kneeling? And you were so disgusted, you know, because, boy, you were going to pray through that night, you know? I can tell you how two ways that you can keep awake. Osmo Swift says to walk. You'll never go to sleep while you're walking. That's one way. I can give you another suggestion. You can pray like Elijah did on top of Mount Carmel. The Bible says he fell on his knees and put his head between his knees. Now, I heard some fool preacher say that one time, so naturally I went home and tried it. He's right. You'll never go to sleep like that. You will feel like somebody has a pin in your back. And there's no danger of you going to sleep hurting bad as you'll hurt if you get on your knees put your head between your knees. Pray. You won't go to sleep, I'll guarantee you. You might scream, but you won't go to sleep. Uh, but seriously... They were, they were human beings, and they fell asleep, and they were so tired, so full of good intentions. They meant so well, but they just didn't do it. They were like us. And then finally, you remember, Jesus uh, went through this terrible experience where the devil hit him. Now, a lot of people think he was trying to cop out on the Calvary. I can't quite go that route. Jesus talked about going to the cross all the time that he walked on the earth. He said, that's what I came for. And my Lord was not a coward, and he didn't back off from anything because it was hard. Now, Calvary was harder than anything that you and I could ever imagine. I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about the spiritual horror of Calvary. The horror of the sinless Son of God being saturated in sin is a horror that we'll never quite understand. But he didn't back out. When he prayed those three times, Father... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Run the references on cup, and you'll find out it's talking about suffering most of the time. What was happening, the devil was trying to kill him in the garden. You think it through. If you haven't thought about this, don't accept it. I, I don't want people to come along and just be like a bunch of little birds, you know, pop their mouth open, and just anything comes along. You lie to get a big Bessie bug in your crawl that way. You'd be like the Berean Christians. you go home and saturate it with prayer and Bible study and find out if these things are so. God's people are being hoodwinked and, because they're swallowing every kind of garbage that's coming along. And some, some, some people are going off on deep ends because they haven't even bothered to read the English dictionary, let alone anything deeper than that. You better, you better learn what these words mean. And if you got a question, it wouldn't hurt you to go back and look at a Greek-English dictionary. You don't have to know Greek. You could even consult another translation besides good old King James. Don't be like the gal who said, well, I like my Bible just like Paul said it in the King James. Beg your pardon, not so. There are a lot of good translations on the market. None of them is going to cause you to apostatize, I'll guarantee you. Some of you are looking at me funny now. Well, I saw that rabbit run across the street and I thought I'd shoot him while we was at it. You ought not to be so delicate that you could be thrown for a loop by something like that. Compare three or four of them, you'll be surprised how much more insight you'll have into what God's saying. Your life will be enriched, not impoverished, and you'll, be, you'll avoid some of these pitfalls of falling into stupidity by building on words that are not really in the original and giving them a meaning they don't really have. That's how false doctrine is bred. Get to reading them. And don't accept everything I say. Check it. 
If it won't check, throw it out. Do like you do with fish and bones. Eat the fish and don't choke on the bones. Now, some fish are so bony, it's not hardly worth the effort. You're welcome. And it's more bones than fish. It's just not worth the effort picking the bones out. But some fish, you know, has a few bones and, and just quite a bit of meat. So just enjoy the meat, but don't get, get a bone hung in your throat now. All right? And it would be nice if the messages were perfect, but since God has imperfect instruments to work through, they're not always going to be perfect. Amen, or oh me. All right. Yours is not going to be very perfect either when you give them out to your friends. All right. But God can do that. Uh, it's it's wonder what God can do. He can hit a pretty good lick with a crooked stick. That's the only thing he's got available. But if he gets a straight one, he'll throw that crooked one down. So I advise you to get straightened up by the Word of God, best you know how, so God will keep on using you. By the way, when the blessings flow, I saw another rabbit run across the trail. I believe I'll shoot him while we're at it, while we're out here in the wilderness a little bit. Uh, just because the blessings of God flow doesn't mean a thing. You say, oh, that's a great man of God. Maybe. Moses was one of the greatest men who ever walked. No doubt about that. They were out in the wilderness, and he had about two and a half, three million people he was keeping going. And they got to complaining, we're out of water, we're starving to death, our flocks and herds, we got camels, we got horses and cows, goats and sheep, we got children, wives, we're all thirsty, we don't have any water. What's you going to do about it, big boy? You led us out here. Well, he went to God, said, Lord, we got a problem. The Lord said, no problem. Walk over there, Moses, take that staff, and you strike that rock, and Niagara Falls will come out. Now, some people think that just a little old creek came out. Do you realize how much water it would take for two and a half million people, or three million, plus all their livestock? God didn't produce a little old branch running down through the, the desert. That would have soaked up in the sand anyhow. It was literal Niagara Falls. They had to move back when that river came out of that rock. All right, now that striking of the rock, we're told in other parts of Scripture, was a picture of Jesus Christ being smitten for the sins of the world. It came out, the time went on, time went on, and then there came a time when they needed water again. God told Moses, said, go and speak to the rock. Because, you see, after you've been to Calvary, you don't need to go back. The rock is smitten once for all. The next time you ask and you receive, you go to the rock, but you ask. You don't have, it doesn't have to be smitten. Jesus doesn't have to die all over again. It's already been done once for all. And this is the picture God was building for us to look at. And types and shadows will help you understand what God is doing. So Moses went out, and this time he was, he was annoyed. I don't see how he kept from leaping on them and choking them. Uh, all that griping, bellyaching bunch he had. But uh, he had had quite a bit of training, seasoning better than me, so he didn't, he didn't jump on, but he, he was... He was just slightly flustered when he went out there. He was so aggravated with those complaining, murmuring people who wouldn't believe God that he hauled off and hit the rock again with his stick. Now, if you and I had been standing there, here came Niagara Falls again, water just all over the place, and the thirsty people were fed and watered. Their needs were met. And if you and I had been looking on, we'd have said, well, huh, if you get to a certain spot in God's service, if you get to a certain level... You can just disregard what God says and go ahead and miracles will happen anyway. Doesn't mean a thing. I'd take you a little further down through the line. God gave the water because the people were thirsty and he dealt with the disobedient prophet on top of a mountain and said, you'll not go into the land. Be careful, we don't always see everything's going on. God, when his people come together and they're thirsty and they're hungry, God will feed them. And he'll bust the daylights out of that disobedient prophet later if he happens to be out of step. That's why we don't have to worry about it. The children of Israel didn't have to go up and say, Now, Lord, Moses didn't do what you said. You ought to get on him. Most of them probably weren't even aware that he was disobeying the Lord. But God knew about it. He just said, he marked it down. And there came a time, he said, All right, Moses, I want to talk to you. Come on up, we're going to have a conference. Got him up on the mountain. He said, Moses, I have a sad thing to tell you, son. You're not going to go into the land. I can just almost see the tears start in Moses' eyes. He said, I'm sorry, son. He said, but I'll tell you what. I'll let you look over the mountain. And he lifted up the clouds. He said, look, there it is. I'll let you see it. But you'll not get to go in. You shouldn't have messed up my picture I was drawing for those generations to come. It's very serious to mess up the picture God's painting. And if you do, God will deal with you about it. Nobody else will, but God will. Now, 
I think we got that rabbit skin. Let's go back. Over here we were in the garden. Jesus is under heavy attack. The Bible said that his sweat became as drops of blood. Now, his sweat was not blood. It became as drops of blood. Watch what it says, not what you think it is. In medical history, there have been two or three cases that uh, have been recorded where people have come under tremendous mental, emotional, psychological pressures to the extent that their heart beat increased, the blood pressure skyrocketed way beyond normal limits to such an extent that the, the blood pressure in the capillaries under the skin was so high that the tiny little hair-like capillaries that give color to your skin ruptured. Now, any time somebody's going through that much misery and pain and suffering, there's going to be a lot of sweating. You've been around where people were suffering. You've seen them pop out in cold sweat, they say. That's what was happening. Jesus was under such attack as Satan moved in to kill him in the garden that his sweat, he was drenched in sweat and the little capillaries under the skin, just under the skin, ruptured and bloody sweat began to pour out and his sweat became as drops of blood, face, everything. Now, why did he, why was he able to pound the Savior? All Jesus' life he walked with a curtain of protection around him. Many times the enemies tried to seize him, to lay hands on him, to do this, that, and the other. They were never successful. He would say, mine hour has not yet come, and he'd walk right through the middle of it. They couldn't do a thing. But as he went to the garden, he said, mine hour is come. What happened? The hedges that were around him dropped. Now, if you want a blessing, meditate on the first chapter of Job about God's hedges. There are hedges around our minds around our bodies, around everything that we have. And unless we open those hedges, or unless God drops those hedges, we are firmly protected. The hedges of protection around Jesus dropped flat. And for the first time in his life, Jesus was wide open for Satan to attack not his divinity, but his human body. And he went to work. He didn't stop to ask questions. He wanted him dead. And he immediately thrust at him and began to put unbelievable, unbearable pressure upon him. And this is what caused the reaction of the sweat that became like drops of blood as the bloody capillaries ruptured under the skin. Now, the thing that happened with Jesus, this is why he prayed, let this cup Pass from me. Father, this is not the plan that was in the beginning. I was to go to the cross. He wasn't trying to cop out on the cross. He was praying, Lord, Father, give me strength to go to the cross. Now, that's more in line with his character, isn't it? It looked as if Satan was going to literally kill him in the garden, and he'd never make it to Calvary. And what he was telling the Father is... Father, I know what we planned. I was to go to the cross. This body is going to die in very short order under this tremendous pressure that Satan is bringing. But, Father, if you've changed your plan, nevertheless, I'll die in the garden if that's what you want. He was the pattern son right to the very end, wasn't he? No matter what. It flew in the face of what he knew to be the plan of God. And yet he even yielded to that and said, Father, if that's the way you want it, it's all right with me. Three times he told the Father it was all right. And the third time the angel came, gave him strength to get to the cross. That's what he asked for. Now follow me a little further. They take him in the garden. The guards come rushing in the arm, the uh, soldiers of the high priest, and Judas is at the head. Now, Jesus did not look different from other people. Otherwise, they could have said, oh, you get that long-haired dude over there, that's Jesus. No, he had his hair cut in Roman fashion, as a matter of fact, because he didn't stand out at all. He said, oh, but I saw a picture. Well, some artist painted that picture. He didn't see him. You better go by what facts are and, what, and get away from fiction. But I won't argue with you about that. I know that Jesus, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, and I know God wouldn't have his son do something that was a shame. 
How long is long? I can tell you easily. Any time a boy has to grow a beard, sideburns to prove he ain't, it's too long. You're welcome. I mean, if you turn him around from the back and you can't tell which he is, it's too long. There are rabbits all over this trail. All right. Uh, let's go a little further. Jesus is seized in the garden. And one of the guards, Judas runs up to kiss him, to identify him, so they be sure to grab the right fella. And one of the soldiers rushes up and grabs him, grabs hold of him. And Peter was standing there, and boy, that was just too much. He swung that sword, tried his best to cut that man's head off, but he ducked just in time and he got his ear. You thought, you thought Peter was a good marksman on the sword? No, he was trying to chop his head off. The fellow ducked and he got his ear instead of his head. He planned to chop his head off. And Jesus, you remember, put the ear back and said, Peter, you can put the sword away. Don't need it. And then they led him away. He went through mock trials. Every trial he went through was illegal under Jewish and Roman law. He never had a legal trial at all. He went to a kangaroo court. And in the process, they stripped off all his clothes, and they skinned him alive with a whip. When Pilate couldn't shut him up any other way, he said, well, if I give him a good whipping, I'll have him scourged. That means to be skinned alive with a whip. Forty strokes save one, thirty-nine lashes. They always subtracted one to be sure they didn't get an extra one in there. And about every five lashes, they put a fresh soldier on so his arm wouldn't get tired. And so it cut all the hide off of him. When they got through with him, he looked like hamburger. Soldiers then took him and put him through all kinds of humiliation. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They plucked out his beard. They slapped him. He was bruised. His nose was bloody. His eyes were black. He looked like something out of a horror movie. If you had seen him, if I had seen him, if the movies that they've made, the pictures the artists have ever painted, painted Jesus the way he looked on the cross, we'd throw up. It would make us ill. They wouldn't dare show it like it is. Listen, the Savior went through all that horror. And then they took him out. He carried that cross. How he ever got to the gate with it, I do not know. He should have died in the garden. The cases, medical history cases, they've only lived two or three hours after that happened. It puts such an overstrain on every organ in the body that the body cannot survive. It just begins to break apart inside hemorrhaging all over the place. But Jesus made it on. They skinned him alive with a whip. A lot of people, a lot of strong men died at the whipping post. Because any time that whip got too low and cut under this rib cage, cut into the liver, he died an agonizing death. Jesus lived through it. He went on. He was brutalized by the soldiers. They threw a cross on his back, and he drug it down through the streets of Jerusalem with little children spitting on him, throwing mud on him. He was doing it all for you and for me. Calvary is one of the ugliest, most gruesome spectacles that ever has been in the world's history. The perfect man of God walking down, dragging that cross, stumbling and falling on those old cobblestones, skinning his knees up. He's bleeding. He's bloody. His eyes are, are swollen shut. He is a mess. Isaiah said he didn't even look like a human being. He was so terribly marked and marred. His visage was, his face was so messed up, he said he didn't look human. And Jesus did all this for you and for me. Now they hung him on the cross. And you remember at noonday, it's when this cry was wrenched from his lips, the scream, the anguish cry, My God, my God, where, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear not. Remember, three hours. They nailed him on the cross at nine in the morning. At noon, the sun went out. And at three o'clock, he dies. He cried in the daytime when the sun was bright and boiling down. He cried in the darkness, and nobody heard when the sun went out. I, thou hearest not in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted. Thou didst deliver them. They cried to thee, were delivered. They trusted in thee, and not confounded, but I am a worm. What's he talking about? He said, I am a worm, no man, a reproach of men, the spies of the people. He said, the prophets in the past, the people of God in the past, cried out to you when they were in distress. 
And you delivered them, you heard them, but I've cried out and you didn't come to my help. Because he said, I'm no man, I'm a worm. Now they had a little worm, special kind of worm. They'd catch it, they put them in a little pestle, and they'd take a mortar and grind it up. And they made this, the crushed worm made a brilliant scarlet dye. And that's what he's talking about. He was a bloody, gruesome mess. He looked like something out of the meat market hanging on that awful cross. By the way, he wasn't very high in the air either. His feet were probably not over a foot off the ground. The artists have it all wrong. They ought to check some history. A lot of people would do good to check some history. You know, they wouldn't make so many fool mistakes. I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. His enemies gathered around at the foot of the cross. They laughed at him. He said they shoot out the lip. They shake the head. Say he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, see he delighted in him. Oh, listen, he said, he, they shoot out the lip. They said, can you imagine at a scene of such carnage and such horror, such misery and suffering, that men would be so brutalized and so horrible that they would walk around and poke fun at the person on the cross? This shows you the depth of the evil that's in the heart of men. The awful effect of demons possessing men's hearts and minds. They walk around him and they, they mock him and they say, Well, he trusted in the Lord. Let's see the Lord deliver him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou, how was Jesus born? He tells us right here. God took him out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was on my mother's breast. When did Jesus know that he was the Son of God? When he was a little infant, suckling at his mother's breast, he came along a lot faster than you and I. Did you know that? He didn't wait till he was 12 years old to find out about that. Jesus always knew he was the Son of God. I was cast upon thee from the womb. He said, I didn't really have anybody except you, Father, from the time I was born. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there's none to help. The lonesomest you'll ever be is when God's a long way off or when you think he is. Many bulls have compassed or circled me. Strong bulls of Basham have beset me round. They have gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Friend, all the demons and the devil's army were gathered round. I don't say the demons in hell because they haven't been there yet. they going. I'm going to be there. I'm going to see it. I'm going to shout and have a glorified fit every time one of them hits the flames. That's right. People tell me that I'm mean, you know. And I hear the enemy begin to scream and carry on. I say, they're singing my song. I enjoy their misery. Listen, they have, they have afflicted and hindered the human race. They attacked the Savior on the cross. They're not worthy of anything. They're reprobate. They have no repentance, no sorrow, nothing for what they've done or what they're doing. And you think I'm not going to enjoy their misery? You bet I am. They have a nickname for me in the spirit world that demons have told me. They say the tormentor has come. They don't like me too much. I can't afford to slip, by the way. There's several hundred got dibs on my scalp first time I get where they can get at me. You say, doesn't that worry you? Why? All they could do is kill me. And they couldn't do that unless God let them. If they kill me, I'll go to heaven and shout all over heaven because I'm home. You don't have to worry about things like that, you know. You don't have to worry about it. You hear the story about the old missionary who was coming back from Africa? We've got a dear one here. This, I understand, is a true story. Back in the days, Teddy Roosevelt was in politics. And this old missionary came back from Africa. He'd buried his wife over there, maybe a child or two. He'd lived his life and his health just about gone. He was old and he, was, he just had to come on back home. He couldn't stand the rigors of it anymore. He was kind of lonesome and everything. He was coming back into New York Harbor on the boat. Teddy Roosevelt was on the same boat, coming back from a big game hunt in Africa. The old missionary was standing by the rail as the boat came into dock, and he was standing there <clears throat> thinking, well, I don't know. I've been gone so long. This doesn't seem like home anymore. wonder if anybody knows that I'm coming. As they got closer to the dock, there was a great big bunch of people, a huge band there. They began, the band began to play, and people began to cheer. 
And the old missionary said, My, I didn't know they knew I was coming. And about that time, Teddy Roosevelt made an appearance, and a great cheer went up, and banners went up, Welcome home, Teddy! The old missionary turned sadly away, and he said, Lord, I don't want to complain, but you know, it doesn't seem hardly fair. This man went over there to shoot a few animals, and here's all this big crowd of people out here, playing a band, cheering, waving, telling him, Welcome home, and there's not a soul on that dock, as far as I know. It's there to even tell me, I'm glad to see you. Welcome home. Then there was a voice came and whispered in this dear man's ear and said, Son, you're not home yet. Praise the Lord. It's going to come a day when we're going to lay aside all the weapons of warfare. We'll lay aside all the gifts. We won't need them anymore. We'll have the giver in his completeness. We won't need the gifts anymore. Well, he said, I'm a worm, crushed out. Strong bulls have compassed me. The demons have confessed to us in the past. And I know people don't like to hear me talk about this, but you know, you can get information from the enemy. You don't have to be a fool to be taught by the enemy, but you, uh, that'd be like saying you couldn't learn anything from captured enemy soldiers. Of course you can. You check it out. But all the host of Satan was right there at the cross. They were. They gathered around. I asked one demon, I said, I guess you thought it was great. He said, well, we were pretty excited. I said, were you there? He said, oh, yes. Yeah. said, everybody was there. He said, Satan had everybody show up. He wanted to see his triumph when he put him on the cross. See, the Bible says in Corinthians, Paul wrote, said if the, God, if the princes of this world had had a lick of sense, well, he didn't put it just like that, but that's what he meant. If they had known what they were doing, they would have never put Jesus on the cross. And they engineered that thing. They ramrodded that deal to get him nailed to the cross. When he escaped them in the garden... They engineered his crucifixion, not knowing that he... Well, they just didn't listen. Jesus said all the time, I, I'm going to lay my life down and I'm going to pick it up. They're not going to take it away from me. I'm going to lay it down when I get ready. And that's exactly what he did. They played right into God's hand, as the devil always does. Sometimes I'd like to take you from Genesis to Revelation just show you. What a, what a tremendous outmaneuvering God's been doing on the devil all through history. The devil does his, be his worst and God does his best. And he always whips the devil. It's just beautiful. Over and over. And he isn't through yet. The greatest victories are yet coming. Now, they come down to this and all the enemy is present for the victory celebration. I said, how about early on the first day of the week. And the demon began to sob bitterly and say, I don't want to think about it. It was so horrible, and he just shook all over and turned white. I said, well, I want you to tell me about it. He said, no, I don't want to talk about it. It's too horrible. I said, but I want to talk about it. He said, yeah, you're always wanting to talk about it, but I don't want to hear it. I said, you mean you weren't there? He said, yes, I was there. I said, I just, it's just so horrible, I just cry every time I think about it. I said, was everybody there? He said, oh, yes, Satan had everybody there. I said, what did he say? He said, well, he said he wasn't coming out of the tomb. I said, what really happened? He said, he came out. And he said, we tried so hard. I said, what did you do? He said, all of us, we tried to hold that stone on. I said, well, <laughs> how did it get open? said, the angels moved it. I said, how many? He said, only two. <laughs> Isn't that glorious? All the hosts of hell was holding that rock, and two angels commissioned of God moved that thing, just rolled it right back with them hanging on. I said, what happened then? He said, oh, hush, I don't want to talk anymore. I said, what happened? He said, well, I went flying back. He said, we all did. I said, Satan too? said, yeah, he went flying back too. The force of Jesus coming out just knocked the daylights out of it. Don't you see? Isn't that great? Jesus came out clothed in the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Keys of hell and death dangling at his belt. Oh, you think he wasn't something else? John had leaned on his breast and loved him when he was here. At the Last Supper, John leaned on his breast and loved him. But when he saw him in his glory, in the first chapter of Revelation, John just went, boom, and hit the floor. He fell like one dead. He fell like a log. He couldn't take the sight of Jesus in his glory. 
You haven't seen Jesus' glory. I haven't either. You may have caught a glimpse. Why, God doesn't want to kill you yet. You remember who was it? Uh, Elijah? Wasn't it that got so hungry to see the Lord and kept asking the Lord and asked the Lord? The Lord said, all right, I'll put you up in this, in this rock. You get in that crack over there. Moses, I'm sorry. Okay. And then he put his hand over him. He said, now I'm going to put my hand over it. I'm going to pass by. And after I get past, I'm going to let loose so you can just see the trail end of my garment. Law, me, when Moses came down, his face was beaming like this, and people couldn't stand to look at him. Because he caught a glimpse of the hindermost parts, like the tail of a comet that went by. Oh, we've got some things coming. Did you know that? And I'll tell you something else. These old bodies can't take it. How would you like to take an engine out of a, uh, one of these big, big old uh, 747s, one of those big jet engines? How would you like to take that and hook it in a Model T? First place, it'd probably squash the Model T. It probably couldn't even hold the weight of it. But even if it had held it up, you crank that thing up. Can't you imagine? Why, it'd tear that old Model T all to pieces, wouldn't it? It wouldn't run down the hill fast. It'd have everything, all the Model T would be flying everywhere. It's not built to take that kind of power. Did you know something? What's coming, we're not built to take. But we've got a new body coming that's built for it. We can be here, and then next minute, not as quick as you think, you can be in another place. Jesus was, and our body's going to be like His. Listen, that was bought on Calvary along with everything else. It's a package deal. Home in heaven, new body, a life down here filled with power to destroy the works of the devil. All that was bought and paid for on Calvary. I haven't appropriated all of it yet, but I'm busy working hunting. I'm hunting. I'm, I'm trying to find those checks, you know, that you cash in. Did you ever go on a, on a uh, treasure hunt when you were a kid? They had clues, you know, and you go this place and you go that place. Oh, listen, they're scattered all through the Word of God where you can get these keys. God wants to put it all together. There are packages on the shelf we haven't claimed yet. Thank God. All the hosts of hell were around him. Look at the uh, accurate description now of this crucifixion scene. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. That speaks of the... That tells you that he was wringing wet with sweat, the awful suffering and anguish of the cross. All my bones are out of joint. Now, this may be something you might not be familiar with. In crucifixion, people ordinarily live three to four days. They nailed them on the cross, and what happened after they hung on the cross a while, and the body sagged against the weight? I don't know whether they were nailed on there with nails or not. Nails are pretty expensive. They may use hardwood pegs. I don't know. But at any rate, they were pinioned on there. And uh, after a while, just like if you hold your arm out, your muscles become tired in here, and first thing you know, they'll, they'll start quivering, and the next thing you know, you'll have muscle spasms because the muscles get overexhausted. Now, if you hung on the cross with the weight of your body, what happened in crucifixion, pretty soon the muscles got so exhausted in here and in the legs, the weight of the body sagging on those, that the body would go into convulsions and almost tear the person off the cross. And it literally pulled the bones out of the sockets in the shoulders and in the hips. And they're still alive, friend. They're still alive. And if they didn't have friends, by the way, to take care of them, the birds would come take their eyes out. If you didn't have somebody stand by the cross and fan off the flies and things like that, you were really in bad trouble. It was a horrible thing. And they usually lived three or four days like that. And the convulsions that were produced by the body, the muscle spasms, would actually jerk the shoulders and the hips out of joint. Now, if you've ever seen somebody with a dislocated shoulder or hip, you know that they're in terrible pain just from that. Think about Jesus. His back is like a meat, a raw meat. He's all beaten, bloody. And, and, and by the way, he was naked on the cross. They stripped all his clothes off when they put him up there. That was part of the shame, to hang up naked before everybody. It was a ghastly picture of the horror of sin. But you know, the episode in the garden didn't kill him. Skinning alive with the whip didn't kill him. Even the convulsions on the cross did not kill him, although he said his bones are all out of joint. Painful, yes, but not dead. But he does tell us how he died. Look at it. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. The thing that broke Jesus was his heart ruptured, and he smothered to death. Now think with me. His heart was like wax, and it melted in the midst of him. Melted in the midst of his bowel. Now, if you melt wax, of course, it becomes liquid and flows, doesn't it? All right, your heart's about the size of your fist. 
When you take, you draw out whole blood, if you go and give blood for a blood transfusion, they draw out blood, and you put it in a beaker, glass beaker, and you let it stand, the red coloring, the red matter, the uh, hemoglobin and other coloring heavy stuff will settle out. And there'll be a clear substance on top that looks like water. We call it plasma. But the hemoglobin and the other heavier parts will settle out if you let it set. Now, what happened to Jesus on the cross when he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? His heart ruptured. The thing that did it was carrying the burden of your sins and mine for three hours and all the world. Sins of all the world, past, present, and future, were taken, balled up, and Paul said he literally became sin. And he carried that three hours, and it finally, his heart broke under the load. You and I are guilty of murder. Every human being on the face of God's earth is guilty of murder, the murder of Jesus Christ, God's Son. By the way, that's the basis of hell, condemnation. Did you know that? If you're not guilty of anything else, you run across these people who have never sinned, they're guilty of murder of God's Son because their sin helped put the cap on the judge. Now, he hung in the cross. When his heart broke, your lungs are like sponges. They just lay there. They don't do anything. They're lazy. So what God did, he put ribs around here with muscles on them, and so your ribs squeeze, the, squeeze those lungs in when you exhale. The air comes out. And then when you inhale, the rib cage releases, and the sponges fill up, and it pulls air in by atmospheric pressure into your lungs. And that's how you breathe. Give you a lesson on anatomy if you didn't know that. Rib cage rises up, lets those lungs, and it squeezes down on them. Now, in the case when a heart ruptures, in the in in uh, when a heart vessel, one of the uh, arteries or one of the veins ruptures near the heart, the blood flows into that cavity and begins to collapse that lung. If enough blood flows in there, you know, of course, it's going to squeeze the air, and they will not be able to breathe. They'll not get enough air. And they'll die. And this is what killed Jesus, his heart ruptured. You say, are you sure of that? Well, certainly. Dr. Luke talk, told us about it, I believe he's the one. Over at the cross, let's go see the soldiers as they come to take them down. They find the two thieves are still alive, so they decide to help them die quicker. So they took a big uh, wooden mallet and broke the, leg, the bones in their legs. That threw them into a state of shock, which killed them. That's merciful, isn't it? I mean, they don't want them to live. Kind of like finding an animal out here in misery, so you just knock it in the head. Well, that's what they did. They just broke the bones in their leg, threw them into shock, and that killed them. Then they started to do the same thing as Jesus, and they looked at him, and one of them said, Well, he doesn't look like he's alive. Ah, uh, he's got to be alive. He hadn't been up there but six hours. I know, but he sure looks dead. So, well, I'll find out. So he put a spear up under this rib cage. When he pulled it out, here this blood, remember, has been sitting there. It's settled down. The red is in the bottom. Now, if you start pouring that blood out of that beaker, you pour it out, it's, the red the heavy stuff's going to come out. It's going to come out all mingled and mixed. It'll look like blood and water mixed up together. And that's what the Scriptures record. Blood and water came out of his side. That's what they recorded it accurately. That's what it looked like. Blood and water. And that's how you save your death. Now, let's go see what else we can learn here from this. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. A potsherd is a little piece of clay pottery. It's a piece of, uh, they use clay dishes. When they broke up, they threw them out on the garbage dump, which was out in the sun, hot sun, and they baked. And the little pieces that were sun-baked and dry were called potsherds. A little piece of broken pottery. He said, I'm just as dry as an old piece of uh, pottery thrown out on the garbage dump and sun-baked. I just dried up. Don't have any strength. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Remember, I thirst. One of the terrible things about losing blood, you remember, if you've been around somebody who's lost a lot of blood, they're thirsty. They're thirsty. And thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have compassed or circled me. I think the dogs and the bulls refer to the, the demons myself. I wouldn't press it on it make me dogmatic, but it sounds an awful lot like them. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. I'm sure that's, that's them. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That's why we know Jesus' feet were nailed. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare on me. The reason they could tell all his bones is because he didn't have stitched clothes on they part my garments among them, cast lots on my vesture. But be thou not far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horn of the unicorns, and so on. 
Isn't that a beautiful thing, what Jesus has done? It's a ghastly, bloody thing, but Calvary's not pretty. Never has been. You see the films of the life of Christ and everything is so sweet and so nice. And they clean the crucifixion up where there's a little trickle of blood here and there. Listen, friend, he was drenched in it. But you know, the thing we need to understand is that Jesus did all this for us. Why did he do it? Because he loves us. Why did he love us? I do not know. There's not any of us worth powdered toast to blow us off the map, is there? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all turned and gone our own way. None of us have been... Uh, God didn't get a prize when He drew any of us, did He? He just got skimmed every time He turned around, didn't He? But He just loved us because He loved us because He loved us. And I don't understand it, but I'm not going to stop to try to understand it. I'm just going to go ahead and enjoy the fact that He loves me and try to walk with Him. And His love is the thing that will bind you and bring you to Him. One reason I want to bring this message on Calvary, did you know that if you want to help people get free and deliverance, it's not optional but absolutely essential that your heart be filled with the love that flowed in Jesus' heart? And did you know that it's available in meeting after meeting? We've seen people come and say, I want to, be, I want to have a compassionate heart. I want to love people. I want to be able to stay for hours, if need be, to help them get free. I want that that gives you that throbbing desire to get people free. You can have it. Did you know that? God's looking for people who are willing to pay the price to be filled with His love. Now, God can use a broken vessel if it's clean, but He won't use a dirty vessel even if it's not cracked. He's particular. He's fussy. And you know another thing about a cracked or broken vessel, it's got so many holes in it till when you pour it full it has to leak and flow all over everybody, doesn't it? So when you see somebody that's being used as a great blessing to other people, they probably all smashed up. So when God pours something into them, they can't hold on to it. They've got to let it go on everybody else. God wants us to come. And he told me one time a long time ago, he said, Son, I want you to ask me to do something for you. And I thought that was exciting to have God to ask me to do something, you know. I said, Oh, yes. What would you like me to do? He said, I want you to ask me to break you like the alabaster box. Uh, <clears throat> I said, Well, Lord, how about let's just, uh, just pour me out like the ointment was. He said, Uh-uh. I want you to ask me to break that alabaster, break you like I broke, that woman broke that alabaster box. See, when you break the box, it's not fit for anything else. And you can't hold on to anything because you lose everything that's in there. And you know, I, I don't remember being afraid too many times, but that was one time I was scared. I talked to the Lord about it, and I cried, and I prayed. This is many years ago. And uh, I said, Lord, couldn't we just do this? And he said, you can do it if you want to. I said, but Lord... He said, I, want, I told you what to ask me. I won't do it unless you ask me. And you know, I, I got feeling such a strong craving to ask him to do that. And you know, I was scared to death to do it. Because somehow or another I figured that wasn't going to be the most pleasant experience I'd ever had. And I didn't think I'd be able to shout about it for a while. There's some things, you know, that God does for you. And it takes you months and years before you get to the place where you can really shout and praise the Lord about it. At the time, it ain't funny at all. That's poor grammar, but that's good theology. But you know, I finally said, All right, Lord, I'll do it. You break me like the alabaster box. Oh, my, my. He did. But I would say this, if you want to be used of the Lord, you're going to have to be broken out of yourself and let God do something. Now, Jesus poured out himself without measure. He held nothing back that he might do the will of the Father perfectly. And by doing the will of the Father, look what he accomplished. And he calls on us to follow him. And his example is to hold nothing back from the Father, but let him break us, let him mold us, let him do whatever he chooses. But I would encourage you to throw your life into the battle for Jesus. There's something for everybody to do. God's got this army, and everybody has a place in it. And there's much to do. And I'd urge you to get into the fight.
you're here today, you've never asked Jesus in your heart, of course you need to first be sure about your relationship with him. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never asked him in your heart, let me encourage you today to pray something like this. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you now, come in, save me from all my sins. And you will. If you're having problems, by all means, seek help. Let somebody help you from the Word of God so you know that you're saved. If you're here today and you're driven, harassed, tormented by things you cannot handle, by all means, seek deliverance from any evil spirits that might be there. Jesus said, Those who believe in my name shall they cast out devils. We believe that. This camp was established to help people get free. And so if you'd come today, we'd be glad to try to help you. So if you want to come, if you need help, by all means, come. Let's stand. Make your way forward if you need help. We never pressure these invitations. If you don't need help, fine. If you do, come. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. Thank you.